Hello, this is Dr. David Kreller of the Department of Chemistry at Georgia Southern University, here with the second video in my set of videos that's going to help you understand fundamental ideas that basically underlie everything that we talk about in the area of thermochemistry. So in the first video, we did a quick review of the properties of energy, and we started to define some terms that you need to be familiar with. But in the first video, we only got as far as defining the idea of the internal energy. So here in the second video we're going to carry on. We're going to define what's meant by heat and work. Energy can flow into or out of systems which affects the total amount of internal energy that they possess. Well here in the second video as we define heat and work we're just going to be a little more specific about the exact kinds of transfers of energy. Okay then we're going to go on and define what's meant by state functions and enthalpy. Heat f is the flow of energy between a system and its surroundings, so either from a system, system to its surroundings or from its surroundings into the system. That occurs because there's some difference in temperature between the system and surroundings. So you probably already know that, that um, heat flows from hot to cold. So there's, there's a specific directionalities associated with the heat flow. Work. Work is the energy that flows between a system and, and its surroundings. Again, either from a system to its surroundings or from the surroundings, from the surroundings into a system that is associated with a physical force pushing through some distance. We now know that systems have a certain amount of internal energy and the total amount of internal energy in a system is affected by the flows of energy that, that may occur. Energy can flow in the form of heat or work. And to keep track of the total change in internal, in, in internal energy of a system, we have to sum the heat that has moved and the work, any work that has been. Now, how do we decide when Q is positive or negative? And similarly, how do we decide whether work is positive or negative when we put it into the equation? Well, to answer that, we basically take the perspective of the system. Again, if I can go back to this analogy, that you can think of the total amount of internal energy in a system as being like the total amount of money in a bank account. In the bank account, we would say that if there's a deposit of energy, the balance increases. So the change in the bank account balance is positive. And so similarly here, we would define Q as positive if heat flows into the system. And similarly, we would define work as positive when work is done on the system by the surroundings. So next up here is just a quick sort of question to test your comprehension. So I'm not going to spend very much time on this slide, but what you want to do, if you want to read this, and I think you should, put the video on pause, read it, and try to decide what is your choice. That's the correct answer. Put it on pause. All right, the right correct response is response D. The next thing we'll do is a little uh, example problem. And you know, chemistry students, when they're in the subject area of thermochemistry, are very regularly sort of bombarded with questions like this. Okay, so you're told that, a, or that, that energy is flowing between a system and its surroundings, either one way or the other. Both there is some work and there is some heat. And you're asked to calculate the net overall change in internal energy. We're going to use this equation. To calculate the total change in internal energy, you're going to have to sum the energy that has moved between the system and its surroundings in forms of heat and work. Well, let's talk about the work first because it's mentioned here. Okay, and here we're, said, we're told that the system performs work on its surroundings. The system, through that transfer of work, has lost some energy. So work takes a negative sign and we're told that the system receives 79 kilojoules of heat from its surroundings. Whereas the work is like a withdrawal that has like a negative sign, the heat is like a deposit of energy which has a positive sign. And so then when we substitute in those numbers we get negative 134 kilojoules. Whoops, there should be a kilo in front of that. Okay, so here's another sample question. Again, put this video on pause and work on this. Solve it. Okay, did you do it? Did you actually do it? 
Okay, the correct response was A. The next thing that we will do is to define what is meant by a state function. This is straight out of Wikipedia. A state function is basically a property of a system that depends on the current state of the system and does not really depend on the way in which you got to that state of the system. That may sound a little bit academic and awfully abstract, but I think the concept of a state function is pretty easily reinforced with some very familiar kind of examples. I like using the example of some different parameters that may change when you're taking a trip. So I'll use the example of a journey, an ultimate journey that you might take between Savannah, which is in the state of Georgia here on the Atlantic coast, and Atlanta, which is inland from the coast north and west of Savannah. Okay, so we're going to start at Savannah and end up in Atlanta. But we're going to think about taking this trip in two possible ways. So the first route would be like actually doing that trip in two legs, starting from Savannah and not going directly to Atlanta, but rather going to the city of Augusta. And then from Augusta, taking the second leg of the trip, then going to Atlanta. And the second route would be like the direct Savannah to Atlanta journey. So here in circles are some variables associated with those trips, the distance and the time that you would spend in your car. So now let's think about the changes in these various parameters as you travel to Savannah to Atlanta by these two routes. As we look at these various parameters, these things that change, that vary as, as we take this trip, you just need to ask yourself, okay, does that change in the parameter depend upon the route that you take or does it only depend on the final state? Okay, so let's look here. Distance, total distance traveled. So, well, if you did, it, did this trip in two legs, actually the distance would turn out to be a little bit greater. So the distance that you travel does depend on path, the way in which you get from the initial state to the final state. So distance is not a state function. Okay, now let's look at the time that you would spend traveling in your car. Okay, so if the route was broken up into two parts, you'd have to add up the time that you that each part took. 157 plus 163, the time spent and that would be 320 minutes. But if you took the more direct path, that would only take 244 minutes. So again, the time that you would spend in the car does depend upon which path that you take. So then, then it's not a state function. Now let's, let's look at the difference in elevation. If you took the trip that had the two parts to it, the total change in elevation would be the sum of the change in elevation from the, associated with the first part of the trip and the second part of the trip. Okay, But the net change in elevation from Savannah to Atlanta would turn out to be about 700 feet. But if you did the direct trip, the change in elevation would still be 700 feet. So then, that's a state function. The change in elevation is a state function. Does not depend upon the path that you take. Now that we have defined state functions, and we've learned about these things, internal energy, heat, and work, now let's talk about these variables and try to figure out whether or not they are state functions. We've got two pictures. In each case, you're starting with a battery that's fully charged. It's a full charge. Maybe you just brought it home from the store or whatever. It's got a full charge. You, you, you bought this battery because it has this energy. So in each case, we're starting with a fully charged battery. And so in both cases, in case A and case B, we're basically going to use the battery and all the energy that's in the battery is going to flow out of the battery and then it's going to be dead. And hopefully, you know, you're using a rechargeable battery, perhaps, that you can recharge and don't create quite as much garbage that way. In situation A, all you do is put the battery into a circuit that's got some sort of, like, resistive element that gives off heat. As the battery uses, you know, loses its energy, only heat is created. There's no work done in this situation. Brings us to scenario B, which we have this brand new fresh battery. We're going to drain it of its energy, but we're going to put in a circuit in which it's connected to a fan. 
So the fan has got like a, a motor, turns electrical energy into uh, kin kinetic energy, the mechanical energy of the fan. And so there's definitely work done to move the blades of the fan and then to push on the particles of air, etc. So there's definitely work done as the battery drains. However, of course, it's impossible to just entirely do work without having some heat produced as well. And so the fan on the motor, of course, would, would get a little bit warm. So in addition to that amount of work that was done, there'd be a little bit of heat. So this is like two paths. Point A is kind of like Savannah in the previous example, and point B being Atlanta. You can take these different paths to get from point A to point B. So path one, it's all heat. Path B, it's heat and work. But in each case, total change of internal energy of the battery is the same. So here you have internal energy. Now you know, oh, that's a state function. But conversely, heat should be you described with the symbol Q, a number, the symbol Q, is not a state function. And work is not a state function because the absolute values of Q and W do depend upon. All right, the last concept that I'm going to introduce is the concept of enthalpy. Now this is a very important concept. We'll first start talking about this in terms of why in the world did anyone ever come up with this? Don't we have enough things to worry about already? Well basically, enthalpy is a way of talking about energy in a system. It's another sort of form of energy. We invented this enthalpy form when all we really want to do is look at the flows of energy as heat. Okay, so we have established, hopefully very clearly by now, that in chemical reactions heat can flow in or out of that system of chemicals in the form of heat or work. Well, we invented the concept of enthalpy to help us whenever all we really care about is the heat kind of allows us to kind of ignore the work. So let's talk about how enthalpy was defined in such a way that permits us to ignore the work. Okay, so enthalpy is defined as the sum of the internal energy, which we've defined very, very well, plus this term, which you find as the product of pressure times volume. And so actually, if you took pressure times volume and multiplied them together, you would get and energy, you know, if you did this with the ideal gas law and, you know, we're kind of putting units in there, you would find that, that if you multiply pressure times volume, you would end up with something that has the units of joules. Things really get interesting when we think about the changes in, these, in the enthalpy. So we'll take this equation and we'll look at the change in both sides. So we'll take kind of like a differential for each side, okay? So the change in enthalpy is equal to the change in what's on the other side of the equation, which is the sum of the change in energy plus the change in this pressure times volume term. Then using the chain rule, I guess the change in this pressure times volume term becomes like we take P outside, so P dV, and then we take V outside plus V dP. In this next step, this uh, uh, derivation, Remember this equation that the change in potential energy is the sum of the heat and the work. So we're going to use that. But also we're going to use this idea that the chemical reactions for which you know, the concept of enthalpy can be applied are the chemical reactions that occur under constant pressure. So the only work is PdV work. Okay. For dE, we'll put in the sum of Q plus W. This is getting a little bit technical. You don't have to, have to fully understand this, but you know, this is for some students, some students may really appreciate this, okay, where this comes from. Okay, so dE is the sum of Q plus W. But for W, it's PdV work. And if dV is positive, then that means that the system has pushed out, done work on its surroundings. So that would that would be like work has a negative term. So it's Q minus PdV, just to keep things, the signs correct there. Now, what do you think happens in this equation? Well, we've got Q minus PdV plus PdV 
plus V DP. Okay, well, you're right. Some things cancel out nicely. Change in enthalpy is equal to Q plus V DP. But wait, we said the concept of enthalpy only applies when we're talking about chemical reactions that occur under a constant pressure. And guess what? That constant pressure is typically pressure of the atmosphere, Earth's atmosphere. Okay, so V DP is zero. So then what we get is change in enthalpy is equal to heat flow. Change in enthalpy is equal to the heat flow, heat that flows, and that heat flow can be positive or negative, whatever that heat flow is, when the chemical reaction occurs under constant, usually atmospheric, pressure. So in a nutshell, a fair sized nutshell, that's where enthalpy comes from. Okay, so there's another series of videos that I've put together that talk about calorimetry. And in calorimetry, enthalpy of chemical reaction can be measured by determining the heat flow into calorimeter. But anyway, that's more fun for you to have. So thank you for watching. Thank you very much for listening. Keep working at it. Good luck in your learning.